Hi, I'm Theo. And these broadcasts are to support the blogs on nomorshi.com's website as well as the online classes. In this episode, part two, or a series on the use of or in ESV's Ezekiel 16. Welcome back to the No More Sea broadcast, where we continue with part two in our series on issues in Ezekiel 16 and the ESV. Now, within verses 15 to 34, several points need further comment. First, the root, again, to commit fornication, shona, to play the harlot, occurs 18 times throughout this unit and helps to create the unit's overall theme. 18 times. Wow, God has been busy. Hmm. Again, most of this is Ezekiel saying, the Lord said this. So this is, you know, gets into it. And, you know, Ezekiel allowed it to be spoken and it put it, God's name on it and God did not, you know, send a asteroid down to burn a lightning bolt to burn Ezekiel. Nor did he necessarily put a lightning bullet on those people. He's given them a chance to repent. Anyway, second, the image and motif of the unfaithful wife here in Ezekiel 16 metaphorically applied to Jerusalem is a common Old Testament motif. And again, go back to the full you know, chapter and, and dig out what Dempsey's doing and all the footnotes and then go out and do your own research and but I'm just, she's summarizing, so I'm just grabbing her summary here. This is a common motif. And so if you have a problem with these things in the Bible, then, you know, you're going to have a problem with the Bible, and then what, so what do we do? You're either going to throw out the Bible, you're going to throw out Yahweh, and that's what many people do. They say, well, see, this is what God said in Ezekiel, so, and you're going to say, God is, I don't want to worship that God. So you either clean it up to make God look good or people get militant against God and say, I can't be a Christian because this is the kind of God that Christians or Jews worship. So we have to clean it up for modern sensibilities. Instead of understanding God wants you to be revolted, God's putting a mirror on these people, making them stare at themselves. And we don't want to look in the mirror <laughs> because it might cause us to get revolted at ourselves. And we're missing the point of the Holy Spirit to do such a wonderful job of being the Holy Spirit to convict the world of sin. Oh no, we can't do that. So, now I want to move on to the other problem that the article brings out and the scholar that brought out brought it to my attention as if you know this is you know this is the smoking gun case closed ESV's guilty you just can't use it why because verse 35 and again there you know there's 18 times and I'm not going to go through all 18 because this applies so just dig out the article and dig out Dempsey and dig out these others therefore prostitute hear the word of the Lord now, again, this is obviously Ezekiel's words, too, by the way, because sometimes God can tell the people, hey, listen to the word of the Lord, and he's speaking by himself in the third uh, person. So, But anyway, but it, the, the focus here is prostitute. Now, the focus here is prostitute is because the ESV has changed the word to prostitute. So why is prostitute okay here and whore okay in the others? And there's a, there's a mix here because it's, it's a curious prostitute, you know, of the 18 times, this is not the only occurrence of prostitute. So what's going on here? Well, again, in Logos, you can click on this and we have a slightly different lemma. It's not the same lemma that we had before and it's not a verb. This is the person. So again, how are they related? This is a prostitute or harlot. <laughs> Biblical sense, female prostitute, a woman who engages in sexual intercourse for payment. And you can see where 
uh, I guess the bad person out there on the left, and then all the bad people, and then prostitute, and this is particularly a female prostitute, but not a female cult prostitute. No, we're not talking about someone, you know, in the cult, in the temple, doing, you know, that kind of thing. It's not that one. So don't go so far. It's right there in this range. It's a female who's doing prostitution. And the ESV did prostitute. So why whore before? Now remember what Dempsey does at this particular verse. Where oddly she chose harlot before. Such that she's even compelled and inclined to use two different English words oddly. So this again inclines is a noun this time. It's not the verb. And it's 2390 and then it goes through and gives the strongs. Uh, but it's interesting, it's 2181, but it's also 2185. And it gives the loud night and it's prostitute, prostitution. So it's, it's 2181 related to 2185, so they're kind of related. But it is a little bit different. And so, you know, there's something different about this word slightly. And the ESV wanted you to catch that. And I don't know, maybe that's, you know... Why is it okay to do it one way? Is, is The argument is, why is it okay to do horror one way and prostitute the other way? Why not just run prostitute all the way through or run whore all the way through? And I don't know because I don't have the notes of the translator. Okay, but it is slightly different. But they chose not to go with the whore for some reason. And they chose to go with prostitution at this time. So that is interesting. So it's not as revolting here, but the word is very close. So there's, again, I gave you the census. So some of the semantical range there. So, and it's not too far off. And the strong numbers are related. So it's not too terrible. Let's continue with Dempsey. So in verses 15 to 34, she, that's Jerusalem, or, you know, she becomes an initiator of harlotry. I love what Dempsey does here. A hussy, incapable of being satisfied by lover after lover and by indirect implication, not even Yahweh can satisfy her, the God of the universe. Well, that's pretty bad when the God of the universe cannot satisfy you. Yeah, you know, it's not that you want the whole world, the universe, you want even more than that. And it's, it's never satisfied. Uh, it's insatiable. Now, Following Yahweh, again, I'm going on more with Dempsey, following Yahweh's list of accusations that Ezekiel announces is a proclamation of intended divine chastisement. Yahweh, the speaker in these verses, now tells his adulterous and murderous wife what he intends to do to her. The phrases, you know, therefore, O whore, hear the word of Yahweh in verse 35, the problem passage. But there's whore again. Dempsey's using it. And Dempsey's using it in verse 35. And I don't know why the ESV didn't. But Dempsey is. So she's using it. So that ought to say something. Don't forget she's a Dominican sister. <laughs> anyway, she goes on. In verse 32, Yahweh has called his wife an adulterous wife. Now in verse 35, she is a whore. So verse 32 is something different than verse 35. And again, Dempsey is wanting you to see the distinction there. The vocative followed by an imperative and an emphasis on Yahweh's word that in turn leads into a prophetic messenger formula adds a derogatory and authoritative tone to Yahweh's message. Yahweh's message is very derogatory. Why does Yahweh go so low and hit below the belt? <laughs> or she is a whore. I thought the article titled an argument in the article is she's not a whore. And maybe that's the point of the article. Why is ESV saying she's not a whore in verse 35. If she's a whore everywhere else. But see, the article didn't dig into Dempsey as I have done. Now we're left with uh, just a few options here uh, before we continue on. A, 
She's not a whore. That would have been great if you were to say the ESV chose not to call her a whore in 35, and that's your problem. B, as I said earlier, you just uh, found something in the article that you liked. You didn't read the article. You just took that one thing out of the article to support what you wanted from. What I'm trying to say is that Wulgar in her article cites something she likes from Dempsey's article, but did not spend the time to understand Dempsey's argument is, is the, probably what happened. And it often happens where we just, again, find something we like in, a, in something, especially the danger of using something like Logos is that you can search tons of things in your library and find something that, you know, you really like. And if you just take that cut and copy and paste it, then you don't realize <laughs> what's being said in the rest of the article or the rest of the chapter. So th that's possible. Or the third option here could be that maybe Woolgar just didn't understand uh, not being, I don't know, a uh, biblical specialist, not understanding some of the arguments that that Dempsey was making. I, I don't think that's possible. I think Dempsey's done good, a uh, well enough job and we pointed it out here. That would be hard to overlook. So I, I really don't think that's possible here, but it's possible maybe in other cases. So I wanted to bring that up. So I really think it's the second option here that, that, that really is behind this. I mean, I just can't really put ma uh, words into Wolger's mouth, but uh, my reading of her article is that. And then, you know, the fact that I chose Dempsey for the reason of, A, she cites Dempsey. B, what Dempsey brings to the table uh, as who she is and her background and her specialty. So, you know, all of that is in view here, you know. So... I've gone to someone who's not only a specialist in the prophets, but someone who's a specialist in feminist interpretations. It just may be that Wolgar only has either uh, certain resources, is not aware, you know, or what. But again, it's just difficult because she has cited Dempsey, and that's the problem, you know. If you go to all the other sources, the normal commentaries and normal study Bibles and things, you may not run across this. Because you do need a specialist to dig this out. And I just don't understand because Wilgar had Dempsey and why, you know, Wilgar didn't go more into Dempsey as I'm doing here. I just don't understand. And that may be the question that needs to be asked. Why is she not a horn? Verse 35 for the ESV. And maybe they need to fix it. I don't know. Again, uh, if I could get this, the study Bible, the translation notes or something from the ESV and figure this out, why they did what they did. Because the language is very close. Now, the rereaders, us, not the readers back then, us, are again confronted with an offensive depiction of women with the law on the side of men. According to the law, the punishment for adultery is death for both parties. But here, the text makes no mention of Jerusalem's lovers being put to death. Hmm. Instead, they will publicly humiliate her. The metaphorical language of the text admits of a strong bias against women. In verse 38, judgment is upon Jerusalem as it is upon other adulteresses and murderers. Again, there is no mention of the man being judged or stoned for his part in the act of adultery. And same thing happens in John 8, by the way, incidentally. Where's the man? But see, part of that, I think, can be explained in some sense. Number one, when you're dealing with one child... <laughs> And they always want to talk about what the other child did. You eventually you got to focus though. Yeah, but I'm talking about what you did. But the child wants you know everything done for everyone else. So you know. Number two. This is Zion. This is Jerusalem. This is you know someone really special, and she should know better. These men are going to go out and do it with all kinds of other women, but this is Yahweh's wife doing it. So she's held to a higher standard. Maybe if the queen does it to the king, you know, my goodness, the queen? 
So then the queen has a higher, you know, it's almost like James 3, 1, where don't be a teacher because you're held to higher standard. You know, you of all people should not make this. The other nations don't know what they're doing. Even other spiritual beings that we talk about in, in, in some of our videos, like on the Divine Council in Psalm 82, you know, okay, they did their thing, but they're not on the hot seat right now. You are. And why did you do it? So, you know, some of these things, you know, go both ways. There are some ways you can kind of get around it in a sense. It doesn't, it doesn't make it right. And, but the question is, are those men going to read this? You know, and, and it, you can push metaphors too far. Okay. You can push metaphors too far and they break down because they're only metaphors. You know, we, we want, we've done thousands of years of research on the Bible and, and we want the Bible to say things a certain way and we're not happy when they say something else. We get very, very upset when they say something else. Okay. Very upset. So, you know, I'm not saying the men need to get off the hook. And maybe they did back then and they shouldn't now, you know. So anyway, maybe it's just, again, a mirror. And, you know, God is not able, who is going to, are the men ever going to read this, you know? Are the men ever going to read this back then? Because again, we're talking about when God spoke this through Ezekiel to tell the people. And then we're expecting that mechanism that was designed for that purpose to then cover us too. And I think we're asking too much of the text because the text as a tool in that day was intent upon speaking directly to Jerusalem for their errors. And even letting them know that these others are going to get by with it. And often sometimes others do get by with things, but it's intimacy, intimacy, she should have known better. They didn't. It's not that they're getting off the hook and we're worried about them and all that. See, we're putting too much on the text. It wasn't designed for that. It's designed right now to be a mirror on her. And yet we want to add all these things, other things and the metaphor breaks down. And when you're using, <laughs> when you're using tools to speak to broken mortals, the tools may be broken because God can't say everything he wants to say. He's just trying to get something done. I can't tell everything, you know, again, how, how do you explain to a five-year-old where babies come from? Well, you just can't say everything. You can only say what the five-year-old can handle at the moment in the context. And God is going to say what he can in the moment to get the most effect out of it to the person who's actually either hopefully would repent, but probably not going to, you know, those kind of things can come into play. And I, I'm not trying to defend God in the sense that I think God needs defended here. I'm trying to defend the mechanism of the text and our misreadings of it or our over expectations of the text to be more than it is. Now, um, Cooper, she points out, Cooper says, though Israel, uh, the harlot was to return the same despised condition of shame, helplessness, and exile she was in before God found and rescued her, naked and bare in verse 39, also back to 7 and 22, the nation would be an example of the justice and judgment of God. An example. I'm using you as an example because maybe they'll repent and you're not repenting. You had close proximity to me and you're not repenting. They don't have close proximity to me and they're not repenting. They may have an excuse in a sense because they may not know as much as you do. It's not gender-based necessarily. It's a metaphor. Anyway, I digress. 
The phrase, in the sight of many women, in verse 41, was a reminder that women were made to watch the judgment of an adulteress so her judgment might be an example and a deterrent to them. That's what Cooper is arguing. Dempsey goes back and says, while Cooper tries to explain the metaphorical language in the text here and elsewhere, he does not address the gender-specific metaphors in this chapter, and so he indirectly accepts the underlying assumptions that the text is making along with certain attitudes and mindsets that are shaped the text at a particular time in a particular culture. How much can he say in that particular time to that particular culture? How much baggage must be added on? And we make God out to be something that he's not, in the sense that we expect God, you know, think about it. Again, when parents talk to children, they dumb their language down to relate to the child. But they don't have everything in mind. They're trying to get something across that the child can grab a hold of. But that doesn't mean that the parent is that dumb. The, the, the parent is trying to get down to the level that the child can receive that instruction. And we're blaming God for coming down to their level to speak to them like they speak. And then we get upset because how can God talk like that? And God's saying, well, how can you talk like that? Because you're my wife. <laughs> so I need you to see it. Again, he's throwing a mirror in front of them. I need you to see the problem. And, and so people are not getting it. In a society characterized by patriarchal and hierarchy, whose divine deity is often expressed in metaphorical and gender-related language that is consistent with the attitudes and perceptions of that patriarchal and hierarchical society, the choice of a husband and wife metaphor to express covenant relationship is one that creates theological problems and legitimizes certain oppressive attitudes and actions that are unacceptable. Amen, sister. I agree. But the vehicle by which God is able to carry his message are humans. God did not write Ezekiel. Ezekiel did. And people forget that. And Ezekiel is just as flawed as they are. But, oh my, you just said Ezekiel is flawed. Ezekiel is not a robot. God is trying to use Ezekiel, and Ezekiel is broken mortal man. But he's still trying to get his message across. So he's got to filter it. So God's pure message gets filtered through a bunch of dirty vessels to a bunch of dirty vessels, and it ends up dirty, and we blame God for being dirty. It's the filters that are dirty. And then we're dirty when we read it, and we muck it up even more. From such conversations, one concludes that the metaphorical language of Ezekiel 16 is not helpful to Ezekiel's audience, nor to his re-readers then and now. Furthermore, many biblical laws need to be reappropriated and reassessed, especially when gender, law, and ideological issues, be they metaphorical or real, are intertwined. Of course. Of course they do. We're not going to read it literally. It was being, again, brought to us through certain filters that were kind of dirty. And they didn't do the best job. They, they kind of mucked it up. So, Okay, Ezekiel 16 is a passage rich in issues related to gender and law. While it speaks of a forgiving God who is faithful to covenant and its restoration, the text is revelatory insofar as it sheds light on many ancient and often oppressive attitudes and actions, some of which are still with us today that shaped then and shape now, and misshaped then and now people's lives as they try now and tried it back then to live a life together in relationship with their God, whom they are and were, Trying to know and understand. The text is also revelatory insofar as it presents a picture of a marriage that in some people's eyes is sorely in need of transformation on the part of both parties involved. Thus, Ezekiel's allegory could use some further editing. And it must be acknowledged that the wonderful vision of human and divine love with all that relationship entails that Ezekiel's attempts to present to his audiences seems to be clouded over by some of the stuff of the day. Yes, of course. And my question to you is, A, if God were to speak today, would he speak the same way? No. Why do we have an Old and New Testament? Because God changed? No. 
Because God is changing people and he's upgrading his messaging. That's what's going on. God doesn't speak the same way in the New Testament that he spoke in the Old Testament because he's upgrading his messaging as the people are being upgraded. So we can't put those words way back then on God's lips today and expect them to have the same weight or conveyance. Now, Block says the first half of the accusation focuses on Jerusalem's prostitution of Yahweh's gifts, 15 to 22, and second on Jerusalem's prostituting herself, 23 to 34. The former deals primarily with religious prostitution, the latter with political, so keep that in mind. Just wanted to throw that in. Now, a bit of a summary here I'd like to reflect upon, and um, I'm wondering if it's so much the ESV that we have the problem with, and it should be ezekiel itself in other words perhaps the esv has done us a great service not so much a disservice to cause us to have to wrestle with these things that we would have otherwise overlooked and that is where bible study and pastors explanations and all that come about (laughs) this is this is interesting remember the title of that article She's not a whore. And remember what we just said from Dempsey herself, one of the star witnesses in the article against the fact, Golden Gay. This is how he titles his section on Ezekiel 16. You're just a whore. John Golden Gay. Now, I couldn't find in my library, and I don't know that he's written one, a commentary by John Golden Gay on Ezekiel, except for this simple one and he doesn't get into it in the latter in the in the in the writing below but i'm sure john golden gate either wrote that title or the editor uh, wrote it and showed it to him and he approved it she's not a whore <laughs> you just a whore how much of us are a mess how much of us are a mess today how much of us still need to be changed Whether or not she is a whore or not, what are we? (laughs) Old John Golden Gate. Wow. You're just a whore. Uh, I think I need to do some careful analysis of my own life to make sure that I'm not abhorred. And let alone if the ESV is. Thank you very much. And God bless you for listening. Stay tuned for more episodes in videos to help you with your journey from nomorec.com.